Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the general track session. Remember, this is the, uh, the focus of this track is anything that doesn't fit into others. Um, if you have questions during this talk, uh, take a look on the right-hand side of the screen. You probably see the chat window right now. There's also a Q&A tab. You can type your question in there. And after the talk is done, we'll uh, bring those questions up on, on uh, the screen for everybody to see and for the speaker to answer. And then there's also the, uh, you can raise your hand. There's a raised hands tab. You can raise your hand and I'll bring you up on stage to ask your question. So um, yeah, welcome uh, our speaker, Jared Mill Millman. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Matt, for introducing me. Um, I'm going to be talking about NetworkX, and uh, particularly I'll, I'll be focusing a bit on um, the developer community and uh, our efforts to rebuild uh, the developer community after um, being around for quite some time. Um, and hopefully these will be lessons that uh, other projects can uh, draw from. And I think there's a lot of overlap with the problems that we've had uh, with at least some of the other core projects. So. For my outline, I'm going to start with a really very brief introduction to NetworkX. I'm assuming most people already know what NetworkX is. Uh, however, uh, it's not super important that you are familiar with NetworkX for this talk. Um, however, I will, uh, in part to compare us to some of the other par uh, parts of the ecosystem, talk about our graph data structure and just briefly mention how our uh, algorithm and API look. Um, then I'll talk a little bit more about the history of NetworkX, which is uh, one of the older projects in the ecosystem. and uh, a little bit about the questions about where we fit in the ecosystem, um, which we've uh, been struggling with recently. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'll be focused a bit more on building the developer community and give you a little bit more of a narrative story about um, how our developer uh, group has evolved over time and what challenges we faced and uh, what we're doing now to try to like increase our developer community. Uh, and finally, uh, if there's some, some time, I'll do a quick invitation to contribute, but um, hopefully, uh, Many of you would be interested in contributing to NetworkX. It's, it's a really great library. It's a pure Python, um, and uh, it I think is a, a place where you can easily get uh, started in the scientific Python ecosystem if you haven't already been contributing. And if you have, uh, there's lots of uh, places to help as well. All right, so um, NetworkX is a Python reference library for network science algorithms. So uh, these are algorithms uh, that involve uh, is a fundamental data structure, a graph object. Uh, which again, I'm assuming everyone knows, but just really briefly, uh, graphs are um, sets of nodes. So one, two, three, four, five are the nodes here, uh, and they're connected by edges. So um, these edges can be directed with arrows and things like that. Uh, you can also put all kinds of um, data on the, the nodes and um, the edges. So why is uh, NetworkX uh, a nice library for this? So one is flexible. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in a second, but uh, you're able to use arbitrary edge data and node types, uh, which is convenient for lots of different um, complex network settings. Uh, we also provide, and other packages provide, uh, the ability to read and convert uh, to NetworkX or other graph formats. Uh, it's also interoperable with other graph libraries and um, array libraries like uh, NumPy. Uh, it's easy to use. It's inherently multi-platform. It's very readable code. Uh, it's pure Python, and uh, you know, it's one of the things where I think part of the interest in the code base is just uh, it's easy to see how an algorithm is implemented. So if you're uh, interested in an algorithm, even if NetworkX isn't performant enough for you, uh, it's mm -hmm. often useful to look at the Python implementation just so you have a better understanding. Uh, it's a very well-documented library, and the documentation is increasing. Uh, and it's also well-tested, uh, you know, whatever those numbers mean. 95% of the lines of code are tested. Uh, I got disconnected. Uh, okay. Uh, you're back, I think. I think you're okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Not sure what happened. All right. Uh, yes. Um, so I think uh, I was just finishing well tested. So it's also powerful. There's hundreds and hundreds of functions for creating, manipulating, uh, measuring, studying, and visualizing networks. I won't go into the details of that, but uh, you can go and look at our documentation. Uh, it also uh, handles data sets with you know, around uh, 10 million nodes and 100 million edges. I put an asterisk on that. Since we are a pure Python library, several of those functions um, in our library may not uh, be performant enough for this. Uh, so it really, your mileage will depend on your application uh, in terms of how large a network you can use. 
or you can analyze. And you might have to be fairly clever about things. OK, so just a quick example here. Uh, you import network X as NX, just like you import NumPy as NP. Uh, and so we're going to just basically create this graph here. Uh, so you create an empty graph. This is just a, a simple undirected graph. Uh, we also offer uh, directed graphs and um, multi graphs. Uh, then you can just add edges. There's other ways of creating graphs. You can read them in. Uh, you can generate them. Uh, you can combine graphs together. But here's just a simple uh, adding edges. Uh, so we add an edge AB uh, that has weight 4. Um, and then uh, we can ask, uh, run an algorithm like shortest path. So we can ask what the shortest weighted path is in the graph G between the nodes A and D. And then you can see that's ABD because uh, 6 is less than 7. All right, so how do uh, we represent this graph G? So uh, our basic underlying data structure, unlike a lot of the ecosystem, is not a NumPy array. It's a dictionary of dictionaries of dictionaries. So um, you can see that here, uh, essentially, a graph uh, is on the top level a dictionary uh, whose uh, keys are the nodes of the graph. And uh, the values for each of those uh, nodes are its adjacency list. So um, here, uh, we've got another dictionary where uh, A is adjacent to B. And the edge data for that uh, edge AB is weight 4. Uh, here, AC and the edge data is uh, weight 3. Uh, and you can right away see that um, uh, there's a very flexible format. So for the nodes, you need any hashable Python object. Uh, and uh, you just need a Python object for the values uh, of the edge attributes. And um, you can basically form any edge attribute you want. So we added weight here, but you could uh, you know, use anything else or something special about weight. Uh, yeah, so just to belabor that point a bit, uh, our graphs are basically dictionaries uh, indexed by uh, nodes or uh, keyed by nodes. And the, the values are the dictionary with neighbors as keys. Um, it has a very natural syntax. So uh, G of U is, returns a dictionary of neighbors for the node U. Uh, G of U returns the edge attribute dictionary for the edge UV. Uh, you can ask whether a node's in the graph G within in G. And you can loop over the nodes of a um, graph by uh, just for node in, in the graph. Uh, this is efficient. Uh, it's adjacency list representation. So this works well for sparse graphs, which uh, a lot of uh, naturally occurring graphs are. Um, it also is a efficient in the sense that you can find edges and remove edges with just two dictionary lookups. And uh, as everyone knows, Python dictionaries are highly optimized. Um, I'm just belaboring this point a little bit because uh, you know we're so used to seeing the scientific Python ecosystem rest on top of NumPy. Um, and in fact, uh, well, let me first get to the history, and I'll come back to that. Yeah, so. Uh, Python was first released in 1991, and dictionaries were a first-class object. Um, but it wasn't until 1998 that uh, Guido first proposed uh, using dictionaries, um, or originally a list, the dictionary of lists, uh, as a way of implementing graphs. Um, four years later, uh, NetworkX began as a research project at Los Alamos National Lab, uh, and uh, implemented that dictionary of dictionary of dictionaries, which had been uh, already proposed by another um, another author uh, before 2002. Uh, SciPy conference in 2004, which I believe is the fourth uh, annual conference, uh, was where NetworkX was first announced. However, uh, due to licensing and public release of uh, National Lab stuff, it took another year before the first public release was made available. Then another five years before 1.0 release came out. Uh, shortly after 1.0, uh, the, the project moved to GitHub. And uh, in 2017, there was a 2.0 release, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, and the difficulties that had. And that was a major interface redesign. Essentially, that was inspired by uh, the changes to dictionaries between Python 2 and Python 3, in particular, uh, the move from uh, having things like uh, you know, uh, keys and items and values returning lists to having them return uh, views and iterators. Uh, that was a very disruptive move. Um, and then you know, up into 2017, we had a fairly robust developer uh, community. Uh, the 2.0 release, we lost a lot of developers. I went to a maintenance mode. Um, I came into the project right around, uh, right a few months before the 2.0 release and uh, became the release manager, helping get it out. Uh, and now, uh, with some funding from CZI, uh, we are proposing a new 3.0 release. And this is a major cleanup. So uh, you know, it shouldn't be as disruptive for the users. Um, 
but it will be like removing tons and tons of legacy code and cleaning up a lot of uh, technical debt that we've accumulated over the last uh, 20 years. All right, so uh, really quickly, where does Network X sit in the ecosystem? This is a, a diagram, uh, part of a diagram that uh, Stefan Vandervault and I made uh, for the NumPy paper that came out last year. And this in my mind, even though I was a Network X developer, uh, it was really the way I saw uh, Network X. You know, you know, obviously the main graph data structure is built on these dictionaries and not NumPy, but uh, we do uh, provide spectral graph theory support uh, through a linear algebra sub package. And, and that's built on top of uh, NumPy arrays or actually SciPy sparse um, arrays or SciPy sparse matrices. Uh, but yeah, in this diagram, you see sort of network X is like depending on uh, these lower libraries, uh, which in my mind meant that we could depend on them. Uh, we were trying to figure out where that could happen. Um, and just recently, uh, we released a new version of uh, network X where we had uh, added NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and Pandas as default dependencies. We had several release candidates. Uh, you know, this had been in for six to seven months. Uh, we tried to get as much uh, feedback as we could. We knew there were some issues, but um, once we made the release, it, it was clear that there was a lot of problems. So SciPy had a problem because it uh, was using Python, and Python was importing Network X. Uh, that actual particular problem has been solved. Python now uh, only needed like a, a single function from Network X, so it's just vendored that part. Um, but we are currently uh, I yanked those two six releases and. Uh, partly because it was right before the SciPy conference and I wanted to focus on this conference. Uh, we've delayed for a bit of that decision, but there's a PR uh, 4967 up on NetworkX's uh, GitHub site. And uh, in that I'm proposing removing those uh, recently added core dependencies, default dependencies. So uh, it looks like NetworkX, at least for the next release, will be, again, absolutely no dependencies. Um, the reason why I mentioned this is I would love to get more uh, feedback uh, or from the community. So uh, if you have a project that uses Network X and you actually cannot have NumPy or SciPy or something else as a dependency as well, uh, it'd be great to have that feedback for this um, because uh, you know we still have this interest in possibly increasing our default dependencies, and uh, we need to have a better understanding of what the implications are for the community. All right, uh, so uh, moving on to the building the developer community. Uh, this will be a much more narrative piece. Uh, I've got some data I will show you, but uh, the data should have a big asterisk beside it. Um, but yes, first, uh, we're on GitHub. So GitHub, Network X, Network X, you'll find us. Um, on my screen, this is a little blurry, but uh, you can see from some of these things that you know we've got about 9,000 stars and uh, over 2,000 forks. Um, which puts us in sort of the range of a scikit image project, but not quite as popular as something like uh, NumPy or scikit-learn or pandas. Um, but it's a fairly widely used project. Uh, there's something like 75,000 uh, other GitHub repos that uh, in some way import this. Uh, we also have a large number of contributors. Uh, when I took the screenshot, it was 488. We get a lot of first-time contributors. Uh, and you can see there's a reasonable amount of issues and pull requests. Just to highlight that this is a, a package that's widely used and has a, a core position in the ecosystem, um, uh, which is part of the problem with us making changes. All right, so uh, here's the first piece of data I'm gonna show. Uh, and again, this is something where uh, I wouldn't overread this. There's a general gist of what I wanna say here. Uh, so in particular, this is a list of commits uh, and the commits aren't all equal. Uh, so in early part of the project, we had merge commits. So some people have many, many merge commits uh, which could correspond to them having a lot of PR review, uh, or it could just be that they came in and did it a little bit later. Uh, commits also uh, have changed over time, so now we squash all of our PRs. So uh, some of the recent uh, commits are quite large compared to older commits. Um, that said, uh, the thing I want to highlight is that we have you know 488, or in this diagram, 485 contributors. And uh, if you just look at the first three or four, you get over 50% of the commits. Um, again, if we weighted this uh, by size of the commits or technical, you know, you have something similar. A small number of people are doing over half the work. Uh, if you get down to this, what, eight or nine people that I've listed here, you're getting to 70 or 80% of uh, the work on the project. So again, you know, we have a huge number of contributors, but many of the contributors are coming in uh, for one commit or one PR and leaving. Uh, and the vast majority of the work is done by this volunteer, small number of volunteers. Um, uh, so 
Sorry about that. All right. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, hopefully this won't cut out again, but uh, one of the things I want to point out is, uh, so Ross has uh, been just involved with the project for about a year uh, and is already you know, in the top 10 people of contributors. So part of what I want to point out, um, so Ross actually was paid on a grant, which uh, was why he got to put so much time in, but uh, essentially this is a project where you very quickly can become a core contributor. Um, there's a lot of uh, low hanging fruit. It's a pure Python library. Uh, and there's tons and tons of review needed. Uh, graph algorithms, if you've been involved uh, doing any graph theory or discrete math and maybe a computer science course or approach graphs from a network science course, um, you'll probably re recognize that uh, there are really fun algorithms and uh, a lot of them are you know, sort of uh, very intuitive to see. Uh, so it can get very mathy if you want, but it also can be a, um, you know, something where we have a lot of heuristics and algorithms that have no proofs behind them. Uh, so uh, it's one where people are doing a lot of the work, but it's also possible for new people to come in quickly and get involved. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about Eric, Dan, and, and myself uh, in our roles because we've been sort of the backbone for a lot of the time for this project. And so again, this is another graph from, uh, this one's from GitHub. Uh, and again, I wouldn't over-focus. This is uh, over time, the number of commits. Um, and again, the same caveat applies that uh, commits are uh, not really indicative exactly of work, but they're a loose proxy. Uh, the more important part is I want to emphasize there's these different phases. So up into about 2014, this is the 1.0 came out around 2010. So this is basically the 1.0 period uh, that we see here with 2011 to 2014 on the left. Uh, this is essentially highly correlated. The number of commits are very correlated if you just took Eric Hagberg and Dan Schultz and added them together. So um, it was really a two-person project with uh, an increasing number of first-time contributors. Around 2014 or a little before, uh, people started talking about the 2.0 release. Uh, and during that period, um, there was also a influx of graduate students, uh, Google Summer of Code students, LANL Summer of Code students, or Summer students. Uh, and so we had a very lively uh, developer community at that point. Um, and uh, a lot of work went into 2.0. Uh, during this period, uh, Eric Hagberg, who had been leading the project, uh, kept getting more and more uh, responsibilities uh, for management at Los Alamos. Uh, and since he had never had this as official part of his job, uh, his efforts in NetworkX have tapered off starting around 2014. Um, and uh, he had been doing release management. Uh, so he and uh, Dan had been doing a lot of the work. Uh, and it was really hard to get the 2.0 release out uh, because Eric was backing out or having other responsibilities come up. Uh, he was also, um, or also the other developers. So we had a huge influx of younger students working on the project. Uh, and then right around the end of 2017, uh, almost everyone graduated. And uh, as many of the projects know, uh, students who graduate uh, who had been very involved in projects uh, frequently uh, have their activity level dramatically drop off once they go into industry. Um, and in fact, uh, by that summer of 2017, uh, development had stopped for a few months. Uh, and that's when I um, I was a grad student and got uh, interested in getting back in the community. I had been working on SciPy and NumPy before I started grad school. Uh, and I uh, was ready to come back in and I was looking around for a project to join. I'd gotten very interested in graph theory and network science and uh, network X uh, seemed to have a little bit of a development problem. Uh, this big bump right before the 2.0 release uh, is a lot of my effort uh, trying to get 2.0 out. Uh, that was a very maintenance and janitorial period of work. Um, most of the substantial work had been done uh, already for the 2.0 release, including um, by Riddle, uh, who's one of our core developers now. Um, and he had done that uh, as a Google Summer of Code period where he did you know, a lot of the implementation of moving our core graph uh, API from the older dictionary style 2.0 to the more view iterator uh, 3.0 dictionary approach. Uh, so after 2.0 came out, uh, NetworkX basically stayed in a uh, sort of maintenance mode. Um, 
up until uh, just very recently when we got some CZI funding. Uh, I'll just point out, uh, we had done a big bout of work uh, just before 2002 or, or 2020, so around 2019. Uh, Dan and I, uh, with Stefan Vanderbilt's help, um, did a bunch of uh, cleanup. So uh, including you know, moving from nose to pie test and removing a bunch of old code. Um, and it was during that period uh, that we realized there was a lot more work that was needed, uh, both to address the technical deficit and debt that we had accumulated, but also we realized we really needed to grow our developer community. Uh, early in 2020, we submitted a grant to uh, CZI, which uh, we were fortunate to have funded. Uh, so this is the very first uh, sustained funding we've had. So we had funding in the past for Summer of Code, but it was almost always for students uh, or new contributors. This is the very first time that the core contributors uh, had some amount of uh, ability to focus on things. Of course, uh, Dan and I both had to keep our uh, daytime jobs. So uh, even though we had some support, uh, it didn't completely allow us to focus 100%. And then with pandemic, there's other issues. But um, essentially, you can see the uh, proposal. I've got the link up here. There's also a little tiny URL link uh, if you want to find it easier. Uh, but you know, in this proposal, we uh, proposed uh, refactoring code and improving performance, uh, making a major release, and trying to grow the developer community. Uh, as part of this, we um, made a, a series of releases starting in, in August of 2020. So the August uh, release had a bunch of work we'd done over the summer that included over 200 PRs by 92 contributors. Um, and a lot of that was like easy starting work. Uh, and then the 2.6 release, which is coming out either uh, last week or now, uh, maybe next week, um, has over 363 PRs by 91 contributors. And these PRs were uh, some of them were quite substantial, uh, unlike the August 2.5 release. Um, so we deprecated lots of code. Uh, we're going to have one more 2.7 release at the end of summer. Uh, it'll be a smaller release. And then uh, our goal is to have 3.0 um, out uh, in December, which uh, we are pretty confident of, because it will largely just be uh, deleting the dep We've uh, deprecated our uh. Sorry about that again. All right. You're fine. We can hear you again. Uh, you asked me to remind you if you were within a few minutes and didn't get to that last yep. slide. So. Yeah, I think I should be just about there. Yep. OK. So I got really three more slides to get through. So uh, one of them was that um, I just wanted to highlight again that we had uh, a lot of help with students. So. Uh, you know, we get a lot of our contributions from academics. And uh, from 2010 to 2011 to 2015 period, uh, we had just several graduate students that were involved. Um, we had some uh, LANL summer students, and we had uh, a few rounds of Google Zoom or Code students. Uh, but then between 2015 and 2021, I think I was the only uh, grad student that was significantly involved with the project. Um, but now uh, you know, I'm still involved. Uh, we've also, with the CZI funding, been able to increase our developer community a bit. We've uh, made a, a core developer team, uh, which uh, is great because we're meeting regularly, uh, weekly, and we also uh, are getting a lot more help with PR and issue uh, review and triage. And uh, all that extra effort also paid off in the sense that uh, we now have the mentor support uh, for four Google Summer of Code students this summer, and uh, we hadn't done that since I believe 2015. Um, so we're very excited about that, uh, and hopefully, um, you know, this will be the beginning of uh, a lot more development for Network X. All right, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of lessons that I think are general uh, and should be useful for other projects. So uh, one, it's hard for a single volunteer to manage and maintain the project. Uh, you know, so one of the core projects, you know, they're large enough that you know, between uh, issue triage, PR review, uh, maintenance. Uh, release management, uh, documentation, and uh, all the other things that are necessary uh, for mentoring and growing the community. Um, you know, single volunteer is just really not sustainable. Uh, two, uh, you can limp along, but even two is pretty small. Uh, another uh, thing I think is that academic volunteers are much more common, especially for the core uh, scientific Python ecosystem than industry volunteers. Uh, and a corollary of that is, or maybe a related fact is that um, 
We've also noticed that student volunteers uh, very, very frequently stop contributing when they graduate or uh, very quickly taper off their contributions. Uh, it's very hard to recruit and mentor student volunteers, um, especially for projects that are so old and substantial. Uh, you know, it can be hard to figure out where the low-hanging fruit is. Uh, it also can be very difficult uh, to get them up to speed with the existing code base. Uh, and that takes a lot of time from the volunteers. Um, and uh, first-time con contributions uh, increase fairly substantially when core developer time allows. So uh, I think you know, the lesson is that if the core developer teams on at least two or three people for these teams can get supported, uh, they're going to have a lot more success in recruiting uh, and mentoring students and um, increasing the number of first-time contributors. But you know, again, it's like the more the core developers step up, the more work there is to be done. Uh, which is a blessing and a curse, I suppose. Uh, another lesson is I think, you know, both in my mind and the community, there's some confusion about what the core projects are uh, in terms of what we can depend on, uh, but there's also confusion about uh, how they're run and how they're funded. Um, so I think we need a, a community to do a better job of communicating uh, with funders, but also with users and uh, each other about that. Uh, there's also a lot of need for more cross-project collaboration and across the ecosystem interaction, which I'm hoping uh, that if you saw the uh, brief talk during the plenary session uh, by Stefan Vandervault on the Scientific Python Ecosystem Coordination Docs, the specs, um, hopefully that's a place where this can happen. Uh, one thing we had in NetworkX was that uh, we ended up you know, having some geospatial stuff, and uh, it, we didn't know how to support it. It wasn't correct, uh, and then we found out that there's a whole geospatial library uh, ecosystem. And so, just communicating with them made our documentation much better and let us remove some stuff. It's also very hard to balance trade-offs between convenience of pure Python versus optimizing uh, via NumPy and SciPy, particularly when uh, you're a project that uh, other projects depend on that don't want to depend on NumPy and SciPy. It's also very hard to address technical debt without funding. Uh, we accumulate quite a bit, and uh, with the volunteer effort, it just wasn't happening until the CZI came through. Uh, the one caveat there is that CZI uh, had traditionally been a one-year funding, and that really it makes it hard to do significant improvements. Um, uh, you know, I think you know for some of these core libraries, the deprecation cycles and the considerations you have to have with dealing with uh, big changes to the core libraries. Uh, can take a several year process just to implement things. Um, it also makes it very difficult to plan. Uh, so I'm running out of time. Um, so just the last slide I will just put up here, but uh, we love to have everyone help. There's lots of things you can do. Uh, just come to our GitHub site. Uh, if you want to contribute to NetworkX, if you want to add uh, documentation in the form of these uh, long form notebooks uh, or guides, you can look at our notebook repository and we're love to, love to have more people help. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jared. Uh, we have a raised hand from Medikin, so I will hand her the mic. Yes, hi, thank you, Hello. Jared, for the great talk. I was really, I really liked the last part of your talk where you talked about the developer kind of change over time, um, the developer community over time. One thing that I'm really curious about is, um, like for projects that don't necessarily get long-term funding, it really seemed like something you talked about is that you can get lots of first-time contributions the more like core developer time you have, but how do you bridge the gap between these like first-time contributors versus getting somebody who's like a longer-term contributor or developer, right? Like I think this is a project that a lot of developers have, or a lot of projects really struggle with is the retention of new contributors in their community? Like, what sort of tips do you think you may have all learned from that? Yeah, so uh, I, I think it's something I'm hoping to spend a lot of time thinking about over the next few years as part of the larger scientific Python ecosystem project that Stefan and I are going to be working on. Um, but uh, one of the things I've sort of anecdotally noticed, and uh, you know, I think we need more data to look at this, but uh, is that, uh, we get lots of flyby first-time contributors for uh, NetworkX, and I think that's partly because we're a pure Python library, uh, and it has a very much like a, you know, just drop in a function for an algorithm. Uh, you don't need to like understand the whole code base, so it's easy in that sense. Uh, but it's been very difficult for us to like retain those first-time developers. Um, mm -hmm. We've historically had a lot more success uh, retaining Google Summer of Code students. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that having them over for a few months and getting them involved with the developer community um, gives them a much better uh, 
gives them a lot more investment in the project. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the Google Summer of Code style things, I think there's outreach and a few other of these things that are really good. However, um, the problem with that is that uh, they take a significant inv investment from the um, core developer team, which uh, often happens to have uh, volunteers running it. And you know, we were trying to get things going during the pandemic, uh, which meant that you know, my work for as writing my dissertation got really much harder and uh, I got much more sucked into that than I had anticipated. Uh, Dan, um, it was the chair of math department in uh, uh, Colgate. Uh, he had to pick up extra teaching load. So at the time when we were trying to ramp up, you know, the fact that we had funding didn't completely help us out because uh, we didn't have mm -hmm. enough funding to like have a long-term plan to get out. So I think there's gonna have to be a funding solution at some point um, where there's some more long-term consistent uh, application of some of the core developers. And that needs to focus, I think, one on getting some of the technical debt out of the way because uh, yeah. you're having first time people come in, you can't expect them to remove all the mistakes you've made. Yeah. Um, and so you need that removed. And then I think you need to have like longer term sustained mentoring projects. Uh, yeah. And that often I think needs to have some funding for the, the students as well. Um, yeah. But it's a tricky problem. It is really tricky. Thank you for answering that. And I agree. Yep. And, you know, Carol in the chat said something about being more liberal with maintainer privileges also. And I think empowering new developers is helpful but you know it can be really hard if you have technical debt because like yeah. it's very hard to empower somebody to like remove stuff when they are just joining a project right yep. so, um, well i thought uh, i should let everybody know that uh, yeah thank you very much uh we are out of time we have one more question i know that we're about to head into a break uh well no actually we we have uh yeah, yeah, we are about to head into a break. So I, I think that, Jared, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll uh, let one more question go. Okay, so we've got um, from Bill, how do you prioritize what technical debt to address and who works on that, and especially if you're not funded and contributors come and go? Yeah, uh, so there was almost no top-down mechanism for that uh, when there's no funding. I, you know, so I did a lot of maintenance and janitorial work over the last uh, four or five years. And I think this is something that happens a lot of places where, um, you know, grad students who are uh, not supposed to be developing, and my research that doesn't involve code at all. Um, so this is an entirely spare time thing, but you know, I needed a break from my work. Um, and uh, it was easy, especially with some of the more uh, maintenance stuff, since I had a background in it, to do that a little bit mindlessly to get you know, recharged. Um, but then, you know, I wouldn't have been steerable uh, other than my own personal interests. Um, and so I think, you know, there really is not much of a way other than just people scratching their own itches when that comes to things. Uh, I also think it was, I had a unique situation because I had a long background in non-client sci-fi development or at least management where I could come in and without much mentoring, uh, which wasn't available when I started, um, quickly get going and uh, Dan, who was uh, doing a lot of the triage and uh, for issues and PR review at the time, um, was able to just trust me and let me go at things. So I think we had a unique uh, situation, uh, which would be much harder for other grad students coming in. I think it would have required Dan um, to spend a lot more time bringing me up to speed. Um, and then I think he also was able to just uh, trust my uh, sort of sense of taste, but uh, that's not a general solution. It's a we got lucky. Um. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jared, for speaking. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Please uh, help me thank our speaker with some emojis there. And I Thanks, think everyone. I will uh, go ahead and end the session. Have a good break and join us for the next uh, beginning of the general session at 1.15 Central Time. Um, see you then. Bye-bye.